Today on Beautiful Feet. There's nothing greater than the Word of God. And that's been proven in the Bible. And you know how you know that? If you go to Luke, the 16th chapter, think about this. Y'all remember Lazarus and the rich man? Y'all remember that story? And remember when he was begging Lazarus to dip his finger in the water? And remember what, remember what, remember what was said to the rich man? And he said, well, would you send somebody back from the dead to speak to my brothers so they won't come here? And what did Moses, and what did, and what was said to him? And here's what was said to him, what's so interesting in that book. It said, no, if they don't believe the words of Moses and the prophets, somebody dead coming back will not help me. But think about it. The Bible says that if somebody from the dead comes back, it's not more important than the word of God. It's all about Jesus. Live for God Studio Productions. This is Beautiful Feet with Lewis Hurt. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, we come this morning, and it's what a privilege to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Father, I pray you just bless today, bless the word of God, bless the people of God, and dear Lord, strengthen your people through the word. But if there is someone here today that does not know you in the partner that sins, let them come to know you today, that they can live a life of fruitful, productive, free life. Dear Lord, bless today. Be with the word. Bless Dan while he's out of town. Be with him. Watch over him. Bless his family. But thank you for all the families that's in this room today as they represented today before you. Let us remember one thing, dear Lord. Without you, we are nothing. So, Father, thank you for just being the wonderful God you are, for loving us so much and allowing us to come today for giving us the health and strength, dear Father something that people take for granted, dear Father. So we want to say to you, thank you, thank you, thank you for loving us. And thank you for my scripture, the scripture for my sister, dear Lord, out of 1 Corinthians 13, dear Father. Because, dear Lord, that's what it's all about. We must demonstrate love. But, Father, one thing we must realize, we must love what is right, though. Not what the world says, but what God says we must love, Father. So help us to love each other, dear Lord, unconditionally, that you will get the glory. And we thank you for this time we're going to spend together today in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Praise God. Okay, I, I know you can hear me. I know you can. Because, I mean, I can hear myself loud enough. Maybe. But uh, praise God, it's so good to be here today with you. And uh, I, was trying to, I was trying to get Don, and, and he, he made me mad because I was trying to pawn this other guy off on y'all. And he said I couldn't. And I said, okay, well, if you say I can't, then I guess I'll come down then. Because I, 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 I was wondering, I said, boy, if I come down here, they probably won't want to hear from me. They probably want to hear from somebody that's they got something to say, huh? But no, praise God. But uh, what I want to talk to you a little bit about this morning was, I want, here's a question I want to ask some of you. How many here, how many is here been with Christ only like a year or so? Has anybody here been with Christ about a year? Anybody in the room been with him about a year? You say you have, ma'am? Okay, praise God. Okay, praise God. Now, has anybody been with him for five years? Okay, I love that. Now, what about ten years? You five? Ten? Well, but you've been with him more than ten, right? Okay, praise God. Anybody been with him more than twenty? Okay, see, now you start getting some hands. Okay, praise God. Now, what about thirty? There you go. Okay, now. I'm not going to go any higher than that <laughs> because we don't want to start, you know, telling how, you know, how old we are, you know, 
Because when you start talking about 40 and 50, that means you're a little bit up in age, right? Because I don't think nobody in here, is anybody in here over, over 75? There's <laughs> a few. Praise God. That's <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, you younger ones keep the age down. Like that young lady back in the corner there. I know, how, how old is that young lady back there sitting next to you? How old is she? 13. Oh, Lord Jesus. Boy, she brings age way down, doesn't she? Uh-huh. Do you, anybody, remember, anybody remember when they was 13? <laughs> it was a long time ago, believe me. <laughs> Praise God. No, but uh, what I want to talk about with you is about the old man and the new man. And uh, the reason I want to talk to you about that is because in the world today, we, we have this, this, this we have a significant problem today in the world. And, and what the problem is, is that people that profess to be Christians should be the new man. But too many of us are still living in the old man. And, 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 and that makes, and that kind of raises a question. And if you listen to the sermon today, it just kind of goes right into what I want to talk to you about this evening, what I want, we kind of want to talk about. But one thing I want to do while I'm talking to you one thing, I, one thing we don't want to do is, we didn't come down here another sermon. That's not what we came down here for. We came down here because I want you to get involved with me because I want to hear from you. Because that's Bible study. A lecture is not Bible study. If you want to get a lecture, let's say you go up to UMKC or you can go to Rockhurst and they give lectures all day long at those schools. Okay? But here we want to study the Bible. We want to come together and I want to hear from you. I want you to talk to me because I want to see what you know. Because me standing there talking to you, that doesn't let me know what you know. Because a lot of people, I, I know I used to do this when I used to, when I first got saved and I was about 10 years into my walk, I used to love to go to Bible studies where the teacher would stand and he would say everything from start to finish. And all I do was listen. And you know why I would do that? Because I didn't know nothing. But when, when I start really mature and start really reading the word and start understanding, then I got out of that Bible class and I went to one where the teacher was asking questions. People around the room were reading the scripture. They were giving their, their viewpoint on the scripture. Because you know what's so interesting what I found about by studying the Bible? I love to hear other people's opinion. I love. And you know, what I, and, and you know why I said opinion? Because that's just what it is. Because seriously, a lot of people got an opinion about the Bible. It's just okay. I'll give you a scripture. Now I want you to think about it. Here's a scripture. Romans 8.28, everybody just loves. Okay, who knows that scripture, Romans 8.28? Okay, go ahead and tell me what that scripture says, then you know it. Okay, right. Okay, so we know that those are called according to his purpose. All things work for the good, right? Okay, now, think about this, y'all. Think about the scripture now. Now, if you're not in Christ and you're not living righteous, how can things be working good in your faith? Think about that. Because, see, you have to be living a right life and, being, and you have to be right with God for him to make everything work in your life. Apart from God, nothing's working right. Because God's not in the midst of it. That's why a lot of times people read the scripture, and I've seen people that don't even go to church, don't even know the Lord, and they'll say, well, yeah, I, yeah, I love that scripture. Romans 8, 20. Because God said he's going to make all things work to the good. No. That ain't what God said. He said, if you're in me, then I'll work things to the good. So that's why a lot of times it's just so good, and it's good to memorize scripture. Boy, it's good. How many of you, when you've been in a situation in your life where you needed you needed help and you remember the scripture that God gave you and it brought you through. Huh? Yeah. You're on your sick baby. And you start thinking about how good God is and what he promised you. And then you start getting revived. Because the word of God is medicine. Huh? There's nothing greater than the word of God. And that's been proven in the Bible. And you know how you know that? If you go to Luke, the 16th chapter, 
Think about this. Y'all remember Lazarus and the rich man? Y'all remember that story? And remember when he was begging Lazarus to dip his finger in the water? And remember what, remember what, remember what was said to the rich man? He said, well, would you send somebody back from the dead to speak to my brothers so they won't come here? And what did Moses, and what did, and what was said to him? And here's what was said to him. What's so interesting in that book. It said, no, if they don't believe the words of Moses and the prophets, somebody dead coming back will not help them. That's how powerful the word is. Now, it's like, it's like, now come on, y'all. If y'all was at a funeral, somebody, somebody got out of a coffin. Talk to me. Somebody tell me something. What would happen? What would you do? If you at a funeral and somebody gets about a coffin. What you going to do? Huh? Where there's no door at, you're going to make a door. Because you're going to get out of there. But think about it. The Bible says that if somebody from the dead comes back, it's not more important than the word of God. See, we always look for something physical we can see, tangible. But the word of God is the most powerful thing because look at all the lives the word has changed. As you look around the room, the word, the word has changed lives. Not, it's, it's not about the preaching of the word. It's about what the word does when it goes out. That's why Isaiah talks about that. It said God's word will never return void, but it will always serve the purpose which it has went forward to do because the word of God is so important. Huh? It's quicker than life and sharp than any two edged sword. Lord have mercy. Is it said that in the Bible, sister? You know it does. Praise God. It's sharp, it's quicker and more powerful than any two edged sword. And you know what I love about it? It said it's able to discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Can you imagine that? And so when we do things, think about that. We do stuff and we'll do something and we think we hide from God and we'll do something. <laughs> but Lord, don't, Lord, don't know I'm doing this. God, God don't see me. You know, I'm going to go ahead and do this because God don't see what I'm doing. Huh? What do you think, sister? What does it say? After that verse, you know what it says? After that verse, it says God sees us as naked creatures standing before him. He looks right through us. He knows everything you do, all your thoughts. When you don't, I, I'll tell you one that's going to get us all. I'll tell you one that's going to get us all. Any of y'all don't like somebody? I know I see y'all face smiling and stuff. Because I know you don't. How are y'all sitting in this room? Got somebody you don't like. I know you do. Because that's our nature. Well, I don't like them. They think they got it going on. They think they smart. Well, she thinks she's cute. Well, he thinks he's he thinks he's handsome. Well, he thinks he's this. I don't like them. And God, and here's what God's saying. Well, wait a minute. I thought you was my child. You're supposed to love everybody. Huh? Regardless of what you think about. Huh? What, what do you think about that? You, you gotta love everybody, regardless. You might not like their way, but you gotta love them. Thank you, brother. Now, how many of y'all think God loves everything each one of y'all do in this room? How many of y'all think God loves everything you do? So raise your hand and tell me what you think God does. Loves, I mean, loves everything you do, everything. If you think that, you need to go ahead and get up and leave right now. <laughs> now, I'm just telling you, because God doesn't like everything we do, okay? And especially he doesn't like when we love, don't love each other, because Jesus came and died for only certain people. Well, that's what the word says, doesn't it? Okay, well, he died. Okay, let's put it like this. Then he died for, he died for uh, the important people. Well, that's what it says. My Bible, he came and he died for the important people that they might be saved. No? He, he came for what? Everybody, huh? So what would be the opposite of every? <laughs> Thank you, sister. There's no opposite of every. If, if you say everybody, that means everybody's included. So when Jesus came, he died for all of us. And it says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that amazing? So that means he loved everybody. But now, like the pastor said this morning, if you got it, everybody's not God's child. Only those that have accepted him as Lord and Savior. 
Okay? So don't be telling somebody on the street, oh, brother, you're God's child. And let's see, they never have been to church. They never have confessed to Christ. They live in a life of sin and everything. But don't call them God's child because they're not. And I know that's cruel, isn't it? But that's what we're going to talk about this morning about the old man and new man. In this scripture here, in 2 Corinthians 5, in uh, verse 12, it's talking about the reconciliation of God. Because Jesus came to only do one thing, was to reconcile us back to God. He didn't come to do anything else. To come and die as a substitutional death on the cross, that we can have a life in God, through Christ Jesus, and have eternal life. That's why Jesus came. No other purpose. He didn't come, nothing else. And you know, I don't know if y'all, any of y'all were listening a few weeks ago when, when that, uh, that young man, Stephen, that's over the youth minister, he said something to me that's always touched me ever since he preached. And I was wondering if any of y'all remember this. He said something that was very profound. He said that uh, God, Jesus did not die to make people Christians. Does anybody remember that? Well, he said it right from the pulpit in front of everybody. He said Jesus didn't come and die to make people Christians. And that's, and that's very profound because he didn't. You know what Jesus came to die for? He came to die to make disciples. Now, what happens is when you become a disciple, the, 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 as you profess and you become like Jesus, you become Christ-like, a Christian. But you're not, Jesus didn't come to make Christians. Because here the problem is why he didn't come to make Christians. And this is the interesting thing that I was thinking about when he said, Here's, I'm going to give it to you why he didn't. Here's why he didn't come to make Christians. It's because, see, Muslims say they're Christians. Buddha says they're Christians. Job Witness says they're Christians. Huh? You got, you got what I'm saying? So we want to be disciples of Jesus. Because you know what disciples do? They're obedient to their master. Christians are not obedient because Job Witness is not obedient to God. Because there's things, in there, there's things that's not in their Bible that's in our Bibles that they don't believe. The one verse they don't even put in their Bible is John 10, 30. When Jesus said, I and the Father are one, they don't have that in their Bible. You know why? Because he's not one. He's two different people for them. You seem as a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, you cannot say that you're a Christian and you don't believe that God and Jesus are the same. Huh? How are you going to do that? Because you have to believe they want to be a Christian. So that's why when I thought about that, that's what I want to share with you this morning. Because that's very interesting what he said. Because the first thing we want to do is, well, I'm a Christian. Well, I'm a Christian. And what does the world do? Everybody's living in sin says they're a the Christian. Huh? No good. So here in first, here in 2 Corinthians in 5-7, Paul is addressing the Corinthian church. And y'all know Paul struggled with the Corinthian church because they had money they had position. And they thought they had it going on. Okay? They, they just knew they had it going on. And a lot of times, y'all know how we kind of get beside ourselves and we think we got it going on too. Huh? How I many of y'all sometimes, when y'all around certain people, y'all feel like y'all just better than them and you got it, you got it all together. Y'all know we all do because I do. Huh? Be true. What, you know what the Bible says? Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. It didn't say, it, 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 didn't, it didn't tell me to examine y'all. It said, examine myself to see where I'm in the faith. And a lot of times, y'all know how that old man rears up and he wants to be important? Huh? Huh? Y'all know he does. Yeah, you get around certain friends because they got something. You want to prove to them you got something to do. Huh? And so you want to brag about what you got, get braggadocious. Huh? Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know, because I do, I do the same thing. And I, and I slap myself and say, boy, get back in line. What's wrong with you? You know you're wrong. But here in this verse here, Paul is uh, saying in here, and this is, like I said, this is about being reconciled to God. It says, but we do not commend ourselves against again to you, but give you an opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance, not in heart. Now, the first thing I want to deal with, I want to ask you about, is anybody here real boastful? you always boasting about this, boasting about that, and boasting about this, and boasting about that. Anybody here do that kind of stuff? And you go and talk to them, and the first thing you do is start boasting about their life. 
What they doing, how they doing, what they got. Huh? Think about that. Paul comes to the Corinthian church. He says, I'm going to let y'all boast, but y'all only going to be boasting to me because you're not going to be boasting to God. Because you got nothing to boast to God about. Because if it wasn't for Jesus, huh? You wouldn't even be here. Okay? You wouldn't even be here. Think about that. It says, so he's going to allow them, he's going to give them a chance to boast about whatever they want to boast about. Because after they get to boasting, then Paul's going to shut them right on down. But he said, but listen here, but the last part says, but they come not in heart. Now, I want, I want, I want, I want y'all to see something here. The God only deals in our lives in our hearts. He doesn't deal with no other parts of us at all. Because all other parts of us is no significant to God at all. What's important to God is where your heart is. Because what does he say? Where your heart is is where your treasure is. Okay? He don't say where your feet step is where your treasure He don't say that. Where your arms reach, where you... No, he says your heart. Because God only deals with the heart. That's why it talks about in the Old Testament about the circumcision in the New Testament. Old Testament it's about not, not the physical circumcision, but the circumcision of the heart. And once your heart has been circumcised, once your heart has been circumcised, you're going to be a new man. That old man is going to go because now your heart has been circumcised. And that's what God wants to deal with our hearts. And when we start letting God deal with our hearts and we start being sincere about what God is doing for us, you know what happens? Then you start becoming the child that God has called you to be when your heart has been circumcised. Then you start learning how to love everybody, no matter if you don't even like them, you love them. Yep. Huh? I, okay, look. Y'all remember in the Bible, the Samaritan people, and remember, y'all there, because a lot of y'all here are some pretty good scholars. Y'all remember that when people would travel that way to Samaria that were Jews, they would go all the way around Samaria. It took them forever to get around because they didn't cut through Samaria, because Samaria they didn't like them at all. The Jews thought they were just filthy dogs. Okay, they're the lowest, lowest class in the world. Okay? Now I know you don't think that about nobody. I know you think everybody's on the same level you are, everybody in this room. Okay? Huh? Well done. Huh? Well done. Everybody in this room, yeah, everybody's on the same level you are. Nobody's less than you. Okay, so, so I don't have to worry about this room. So I'm going to be talking to the people out there. <laughs> Not y'all. Okay? Now, get this. So now here's Jesus. Let's see. Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the anointed one. He had the nerves to say we must go through Samaria. He went, went straight to the well because he knew what was at the well. And let's see, there was a lady there that wasn't the type of woman that we would want our daughters to be or our wives to be. Is that right? She was, well, we, okay, we use a nice word. We're going to call her loose. We're going to call her a little loose, okay? Now, here's the savior of the world, God's anointed son. He has the nerves to go up to the well and start talking to this woman that the Jews did not even deal with. And Jesus stood there and held a conversation with her. And he never one time ridiculed her, not one time. But what he let her see is that her life was off course. And she needed to save her. And look how, what he done, what he led her to. And she actually, become, she actually became the first evangelist of the word of God. Because what did she do? After he got to talk to her, she ran. And you know what was so funny about it is? She ran and told the men in the village about Jesus. Isn't that amazing? She didn't, go, and this, she didn't say she went and talked to no women. She went and told the men in the village about Jesus. And they listened to her because they seen the change in her. That old woman had passed away in that moment talking to Jesus. Now she was that new woman and they could see it in her. And when she spoke to them, wow. And they had to come and see him. Think about that. Heart, heart change. Her heart was changed. Not her thinking, not her attitude, none of that. Her heart was changed. Because when your heart's changed, your thinking, your attitude, your mentality, everything changes when your heart's changed. 
This is why people are struggling in the world today in Christian walk, because their heart hasn't been changed. This is why, tough subject, but you know me, I'm not scared of no tough subject. Y'all know that. I'm not afraid at all. This is why, just like today, that we know today there's such a racism. Right? Y'all know it is. Come on now. Because it's been going on since the world began. Okay? People don't like people. This person don't like that person. And now, what Satan works on really today, this white and black issue, Satan works on that tough. He plays on that. He, he thrives on that. You know, where we think one's better than the other ones, one's less than the other one, all that kind of crazy stuff. But let me tell you something. When your heart's right, what you'll see is a brother and sister you can love on. That's what you'll see. Because that's what it's all about. It ain't about white and black. Because when God looks down at the world, like I told you before, he only sees two people. That's saved and unsaved. That's all God sees. He doesn't see nobody else. Okay? He ain't talking about, oh, I love those black folks over there because they're such nice people. And he ain't saying, oh, these white folks over here, oh, they live so good. I love them how they live. He ain't thinking about y'all. He ain't thinking about none of us if we're not saved. And that's just been truthful with you. Come on now. Get, get, it, get it together. Get our hearts right. So Paul talked about it. So I, wanted, I, I want you to, this word reconcile. I was going to the dictionary. I want to look up what this recon, reconciliation. I want to get, and it was just one meaning in there that jumped out to me when I looked in the dictionary. And this meaning was interesting. Okay, to be reconciled to God, to bring oneself and to accept, he has finally reconciled himself to the change of management. Now, the reason why I wanted to use this song, y'all, is because before you came to Jesus, your manager was the devil. The devil ran your life. Come on now. Before you came to Christ, you were living for the devil. No, who, who, in here was, who in here was born saved? Raise your hand real quick. Who in here was born saved? Raise your hand real quick. Okay, you put your hand up, you need to get out. Because <laughs> nobody in here was born saved. Okay? All of us had to, if it wasn't for God, Jesus died on the cross, and God pursuing us, we never would have came to Jesus. None of y'all came to Jesus. So don't, don't, don't tell it nobody else that you decided to come to Jesus on a certain day because you didn't. Because the Bible tells you that you didn't. Because if you read the book of John, the sixth chapter real carefully, you will see that because God pursued you, you came to him. Okay? You, he, he pursued you. Because he tells you right there in the Bible. He says, unless my father draws you in John 6, 44, you read it for yourself. And somebody, I tell you, somebody turn to John 6, 44 and read it for you. Turn to John 6, 44 and read it. And so you read it and you tell us what you think. How many how many y'all how many y'all got your swords with you today? Because that's the only weapon you got is your sword is a fighter. That's the only thing you got. But what, nothing else you can defend you. Because because you hollering out, Lord, you do Satan, that ain't helping. Because Satan will just jump all over. Okay? So you, you need to have your word. You need to run throwing your phone or whatever. Who got John 644? Okay, go ahead, brother. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Hmm. So, so what, what does it say there, brother? What's it saying? It says he pursues us. So without him pursuing us, what's going to happen? Well, he's going to become a new man. That's it. So see, y'all, from the foundation of the earth, before the world was even made, God had already put a plan in motion through the counsel of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That counsel came together, and they made a plan. Because they knew they was going to redeem man. That was before the world began. The world hadn't, they came into place yet. So they got together and said, okay, this is what we got to do. Because we know when we create man, what they're going to do. Now, here's what I want y'all to get a hold of. Because I, I know a lot of people don't, don't like this. God knew everything that was going to happen before it happened, before the world began. So what now? So it's called foreknowledge. Okay. God's foreknowledge, he knew. So God knew he had an institute a plan that he could implement man into. Okay? So this is why it flows the way it does. It's because God set it up so we can be a part of it. But you know what? We have no hands in it. He just said, let's be a part of it. It's just like what's going on in Israel right now. 
let me tell y'all something. Don't worry about Israel. Just pray for them. Roll on. Because God's got a plan with Israel. And God said this, and this is how I'm going to tell you why you can roll on, because here's what God says in the word. He says, until I return, there will never be no peace in Israel. So don't waste your time praying that the war stops, because it's not, because they've been warring since, let's see, two people were born. Who was the two people that were born that the war started through? Who's, anybody know who two people were? Let's go. There you go. There you go. That's my sister back there. I like, I love them kind of people like that. She said, Jacob and Esau. Now think about this. When they started warring back then, when they were coming out of the womb, that war has continued since that time still today. When you read in the book of Isaiah, every time God had to wipe out lands, here's an interesting thing. The families were either from the, the, the uh, either from Esau that was against Jacob, all those people were against Jacob, and they continue to war to this day against him. And that's just how it is, and it's not going to end. It's, it's going to last until Jesus comes back, because he's got a plan for Israel. He's got a plan for his people. And because they were disobedient, they rejected him. This is their consequences. So God's got that under control there. That's a spiritual war. That's not a, that's not a worldly war, y'all. They ain't fighting for, fighting for nutrition and all that kind of stuff. That's just a part of what we think. They're fighting because it's a spiritual war. And it's going to continue. But pray for Israel. Pray that God will move upon them. Pray that God will keep them. But this is the thing. This is, this is, this is what I'm saying about a new man. With, if they were to realize when Jesus came, if they would accept him as Savior, none of this would happen. It would have been a totally different situation over there because they would have accepted it. It's just like in your life sitting in this room. If you got a chaotic life, things are out of control, it's because you know what? You haven't accepted the new manager yet. You're still going under the old manager, which is the devil. Amen. So you got to come under the new manager, which is Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And that means you'll be reconciled to God. That's what, that's what that means. So when you think about this, what Paul said, look what Paul says here in 13. If we abide ourselves it is for God. Or if we are a sound mind, it is for you. See, Paul and them, when Paul always came to address the people, he always let them know, I'm only here for one reason, and that's Jesus Christ. I'm not here for nothing else. I'm only here to tell you about Jesus. That's what I love about Paul. He, didn't, he wanted them to know, I'm only here for, I'm, when I come down here to talk to you, I'm only here for one purpose, to tell you about Jesus. Because you know the only thing that's going to keep you and save you and keep you and it's going only Jesus. Nothing else can keep you. you. The Bible says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? But lose his soul. What does it profit? It don't profit him nothing. Because if you don't have Jesus, you can have all the world's riches, everything. What did, what was Solomon lack? Anybody know what Solomon lacked? There's one thing he did lack. And you know what it was? Willpower. Yeah. <laughs> That's why they like was willpower. Because he couldn't, he he had all the wonderful wives. Man, I can't imagine having a thousand wives. Wow. <laughs> Look at this brother here smiling. He's smiling, this brother. Right here. Huh? Can you imagine having a thousand wives, brother? Huh? No. Well, you couldn't take them all to dinner, that's for sure. Huh? <laughs> yes, sir. Man, that would be something. I know Mike, Mike, Mike said, no, uh -uh. Mike, uh, Mike, Mike put his head down. He, he ain't let nobody think nothing like that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but yeah, think about that. But here the thing is, it doesn't profit us to gain the whole world. Paul said, I come to you. I want to speak boldly to you. I want to say to you, you need Jesus. Because when you got Jesus, you got it all. Let's see, the Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the earth is his, and the fullness thereof is his. Everything's his. How many of y'all own y'all's house, car, and everything? Anybody here own everything they got? Don't you raise your hand, because you don't. <laughs> you don't. Okay, if you pass tomorrow, you taking your stuff with you? You ain't taking nothing with you. That's why you don't own it. 
But, but when the world, the world says, well, if you pay your house off, it's yours. If you pay your car off, it's yours. And while you live in the shores. But once you die, shoot. somebody that's a heathen ain't going to get that car. They ain't going to tear it up. He's going to move into your house and tear your house up. And you're going to be mad. Why? You ain't mad while you're dead? You'll be laying your, great, go lay in your coffin mad because they tore your house up. Huh? Uh, <laughs> they're, over, they're over about ready to fall out of the seat. Get out of here. <laughs> Think about that. So Paul came. And look at here. Look at this. In fifth, look at this in 14. For the love of Christ compels us. We judge thus, if anyone died for all, then all die. And you know what's funny is? Here, the greatest thing about this verse is here that we don't understand. One thing is we don't want to die to ourselves for nothing. And what they don't realize is Jesus had to die to multiply itself through the Holy Spirit. He had to. That's why he said, I must go away. I must go through this. I must go to the grave. I must do this. Because if I do, then I'll be multiplied. Then the comforter will come. And the same way for you. If you let your life die in Christ, then you become more effective for Jesus. When you start mortifying that old body of yours that you just love, then you become more effective. That's why Paul was so effective because he let the old man die. And the new man rose up. Because y'all know, come on y'all, Paul was a pretty good man. Paul lived a pretty good life. He didn't, he didn't hurt anybody. He pretty much, he pretty much was pretty kind to everybody. He pretty much served the church, served God, did all the right things. That's what my Bible says. Is that right? Huh? <laughs> this sister back here shaking her head right here. What, 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 what do you think about what I just said? What do you think about that? Uh, you got to be kidding me. He, Paul did that, but he did it for the grace, but he did it for the sake of God, though. Huh? Because you know what? He did it out of ignorance because of the law, because how he grew up, because he grew up with the Pharisees. And y'all know about Pharisees. Anybody here, anybody here like, like want to be a Pharisee? Anybody want to be like that? Yeah. Anybody want to be a Pharisee? Because yeah. Pharisees had it going on, didn't they? Let's see, they pray on the corner. Everybody hear them. They pray a long prayer so everybody can hear them. When they give their arms, they hold it up so everybody can see what they put in the tray. Huh? When they do all the things, they did everything so everybody can give them recognition. And some of us do that too. We want to be recognized. Now, any of any y'all been serving the church for a while and you think you need to be recognized? Come tell you something. You're wrong. Just keep on serving. And you get recognized when you get to. Because Jesus said, oh, you do it openly, I'll reward you secretly. I'll reward you. I'll take care of you. So when you think about that, and so Paul was trying to let them see this. He says he's trying to compel us because he judges thus. If anyone died, Christ died for us all. So we all die. The Bible says if you want to keep your life, give your life. But if you want to save your life, you're going to lose your life. That's what the scripture tells us. Okay? Just telling you how it is. And look at this 15. He says, And he died for all, that those who should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Wow! Who are you living for? Jesus! Because he died. He rose again. Now, how many of y'all been resurrected? Anybody in this room been resurrected? Now, you've been born again, but ain't nobody in this room been resurrected. Because that doesn't come to after we, Jesus comes to the clouds, and then he's going to resurrect us. He's going to raise us up. Okay? But right now, no. And this thing about talking about people going back to reincarnation, that's a bunch of crap. <laughs> ain't nobody going to be reincarnated in nothing. Okay? That's the talk of the devil. Because there's not such a reincarnation. Okay? There's no such of that. But people talk about that stuff. So that verse 15 is letting us know that if we're in Christ, we have been resurrected. We, 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 our bodies, our hearts, our minds, through Christ we have, through his physical death on the cross, he resurrected us. 
And y'all remember what it says. If I, what it says in the Bible, we talk about Christ being crucified. He, like Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Not I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. And we all have been crucified if we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. We've been crucified. And the thing I ask you, have you been crucified yet? Because you haven't been. See, because you know, your Romans 12, 1 says, let your body be a living sacrifice, holy and separate unto God. Now, let me tell you something about Romans 12, 1. You cannot be a living sacrifice and please God. And you know why you can't? Because until you die and become the sacrifice God wants you to be, then you can please God. So you have to die first. And the living sacrifice is when you actually have accepted Jesus and he's your savior. Then you are a living sacrifice. You are a living testimony. Till then, no. And that's why he says that. Let your body be a living sacrifice. Holy and unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then we look at what he said. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your Well, what about the renewing of your feelings? Huh? Can't can you feel good sometimes? Can't you feel, can't you feel yourself in the spirituality? Huh? Okay, you know how people have, how, how many of y'all got a statue in y'all's house? And y'all, y'all, y'all go over and pray to the statue. How many of y'all got that in y'all's house? Y'all have a statue. Or y'all got a picture of Jesus hanging on the wall. And you go over to the picture and you pray, God bless me. Oh, Lord, thank you so much. And you pray to the picture. How many of y'all do that in y'all's house? Huh? Anybody do that in here? Let me tell you something. If you got a picture of Jesus in your house, you better get rid of it. Because that's not how Jesus looks. Get rid of that picture. Throw it out right now. Give it to the trash man. Because I'm telling you right now, it's not real. Those statues you see in, when you go into the Catholic churches, that's not a pigment. That's not a picture of God at all. If you read your Bible, that's not it. And you, I, I look around this room, and some of y'all been to Israel. And y'all been to the Church of Nativity. And in the Church of Nativity, those pictures we got hanging in our house, they ain't the same ones that's hanging in the Church of Nativity. Isn't that interesting? And let's see, that church is 2,500 years old. So I would think they would really have a really picture of what God would look at from 2,500 years ago. What do you think? That picture of that guy that's painted last year of Jesus? Get rid of it. It's not good. I'm telling you. Don't look at that and think that's God because that's not God. No. That's not even how he looks. Don't be fooled by that. Okay? So look at this. Look at verse 16. Therefore now, on, therefore now, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet know we him no longer. The disciples walk with Jesus in the flesh. They don't know him anymore like that. Now they know him as the risen Savior. And the same way we should do each other. Let's stop looking at each other's fleshly walk. And let's look at each other through the spiritual eye. Let's look at each other as brothers and sisters in Christ and start evaluating people on the merits of what Jesus has done. Not on the merits of what, because y'all know something? And, 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 don't, and don't take this as trying to be hard on y'all. But none of y'all have no merits to offer God at all. I don't have any, you don't have any. All the work that you've done, it doesn't amount to nothing. Unless Jesus comes before the Father. And when Jesus comes before the Father, he says, Father, this is your child. But on your merits, forget it. You have no merits at all. You have nothing to offer God. None of us do. We have nothing. So I don't care if you're rich. I don't care if you got the best house, you drive the best car, you got the most money, you got the best job and everything. Them merits mean nothing to God. They mean nothing to him because you have no merits. Don't get caught up in who you are and what you're doing and how you think you're living your life and how good you are. Because let me tell you something, it means nothing to nobody. Because there's always somebody got more than you. Huh? How many of y'all know somebody got more than you? Let's see. If I started counting this room, everybody in this room got more than I got. Everybody does. So I can't say nothing. Because I'll be the least of the least of the least of the least. Huh? I only got no, no, no. That's why he says, no, don't do that. I, I knew Christ when I walked with him. Now I know him as a risen Savior. But look at this 517. And this will be going to kind of close. Look at this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
He is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now, look at this verse real good. Now I want to ask somebody something. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Now, here's what I want to ask y'all. And anybody can answer. What does it mean to be a new creature in Christ? This basically is very basic. So do you have to give me a dissertation? Stand for 15 minutes, explain to me what it means, because it doesn't mean all that you're going to say. Because it's very simple what it means. Somebody go and tell me what a new man in Christ means. What does it mean that you're a new man in Christ? Somebody tell me what it means. Come on. Somebody talk to me. What do you think? Go ahead, sister. When you become a believer, a disciple of Christ, I like the way you said that, he changes you on the inside. As you live the life that he's planted in your heart, it begins to change everything in your life. <clears throat> it's not necessarily always perfect, but it's becoming like him. There you go. I love that. Thank you for clearing for that, sister. Because the Bible talks about maturity. And it's not talking about perfect. Because ain't none of us perfect. But we are maturing in Christ. Very good. That's, 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 that's right, on, right on point. What my sister said. Love you for that. Thank you for that. Because see, now, here the thing is. Now you heard it. So now you know what it means to be a new man. So don't let somebody tell you that's living in sin. I'm thinking about changing my life. Or I'm thinking about becoming a Christian. And then they tell you that they've changed life. No. Ain't no thinking about it is you are. Thinking about it ain't getting it. Okay? Because you're the new man. And look what it says here. It says, if anyone being Christ is a new man, a new creation. Old things have passed away. What old things is he talking about here? Real quick, somebody tell me. What old things is he talking about? Anybody got any idea what he's talking about? These old things has passed away? Anybody got any idea? Sad. What? Sad. Bam. Sin. Had that sin we used to have in our lives, those ideals we had about what we were going to do, our priorities, how we were going to live, all that stuff is out the door. Because you know what? You have new priorities now. And you know what your priorities are? Jesus. I love that. If your priorities are not on Jesus, then you got the wrong priorities. As a believer. See, the world tells you this, this, and that, and that, and then this, that. But don't listen to the world, because the world will get you in trouble. They'll get you in serious trouble, world with. Okay? Well, listen to them. That's why it says that. So, when you look at it, it says, it says, all things have become new. Man, can you imagine that? Your life changed and everything in your life is brand new. Just think if you were to let Jesus dominate your life, how you would treat people, how you would treat the things of God. When you come to worship on Sunday mornings, you won't get up on Sunday morning worry about eating breakfast. You won't get up on Sunday morning worrying about this, that, that. You know what you do get up on Sunday morning? Only thing you got your mind on is God. That's it. Can you imagine that? You wake up on Sunday morning and your mind is totally focused on Jesus. Then you know what can happen? I'm going to tell you what can happen. Here's what we're going to close. If you wake up on Sunday mornings and your mind is totally focused on Jesus, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're ready to worship. But see, when you wake up ready, what you're going to have for dinner that day and what you have for breakfast and what you're going to put on and all this kind of stuff like that, that's why most of us can't worship God that way. That's, why, that's what hurts us. That's what kills us. Because you're worried about everything. The right shoes on. Put something on and get here. Huh? Yeah, come on, let's be for real. Okay, having the right shoes. Okay, okay, if you got on the right suit and the right shoes, how is that going to benefit God worshiping God? How, how, me being dressed like this, how does this benefit me to worship God? This doesn't benefit me at all. This is a waste of time. That's why you plan it Saturday night. Instead of being out late or up late watching TV, because your program will show you just got to see it. It doesn't end until 12 o'clock at night. Then you wake up red eyed it and you can't think. And then you get up, you want to throw something together, you want to think about it. Then you say, then anyway, as you're driving here, you don't get you don't even focus on Christ till you get in the parking lot. And some people don't even focus till you get ready to walk in the sanctuary. Then when they get ready to walk to the door, say, chair, okay, let me think about how to worship God today. No. Okay, here it is. 
God says, worship me in spirit and in truth. Now I gave it to you, what you can't do no more. You got to stop. That's what it's talking about. Everything is new. Start coming to worship, ready to worship. Husband and wives, don't drive to church arguing all the way to church. People that got, if any of y'all have grandchildren, don't talk to your grandchildren coming to church. Let them talk. You don't talk. Because their children don't respond to them. Because it takes you off your focus of Jesus. You know something? How many of y'all, when y'all work y'all's jobs, it, here's what I'll say real quick. Okay, you got a job and you're working it. How many of y'all told your boss, well, I'm not taking these classes. I'm not going to do this, but I'm going to stay on this job. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to be on this job. And, and you can't tell me what to do. How many of y'all did y'all's jobs like that? Uh, what would you say? Thank you very much, sister. But that's how we do Jesus, though. We'll do Jesus that way. Jesus tells us, Jesus tells us, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come unto the Father but by me. But yet and still we let people tell us there's other ways to get to heaven. Think about that, y'all. And there ain't no other way. Focus on Jesus. Be ready to worship. And this is what I say to y'all. When y'all, you know, and this is something I always love to tell people when I finish talking. I know y'all, some of y'all say, I wish he would leave this church, all that dang hollering back there and all that amen and hallelujah and clapping his hands all out and everything. But let me tell you something. Jesus delivered me from something you could never imagine. So I have to praise God because he delivered me. And he said, when I praise him, be bold about it and don't be ashamed. So when you hear back there shouting and clapping my hands, it's because I'm thanking God for what he's done for me. Because he brought me out of muck and mire, the darkness of my life, and he put me on solid ground. So I got to tell Jesus, thank you. Praise God. And when I heard the preacher preaching, I get excited. I can come, I, I'm going to tell you, I can come to fellowship and they ain't got to do no singing, no nothing. We can just preach all the whole time I'm here and I'll be happy as can be. Because that's how I see Jesus. Sometimes when I'm in my car, I'm carrying on something terrible in my car. Sometimes I go downstairs and study. I try to be quiet. I go on the way to hear everything up down there and get somebody down there beat me to death. I'm down there reading the word of God and I get all happy and I say, praise God, Jesus. Just get happy. We're going to close. I just get happy. I do. When you talk, talk about Jesus, I get happy. Because what he has done for me I was a no good, dirty, filthy wretch. And Jesus saved me. Praise God. Let's bow here. Father, we thank you for this time together. Bless us now. Thank you for your word. Because the word is the only thing that's going to keep us, dear Father. Nothing else in this life is better than the word of God. Please bless all those that sit here that hear. Let us take what has been said today. Run with it. Let us be bold for you. Let us not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ that has given us life. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We pray this blessings on this crowd. You bless their families, their husbands, their wives, their children, their grandchildren. Bless their homes. But most of all, let them stay focused on the cross of Jesus Christ. And we thank you and we praise you for the God you are in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Praise God.